good morning. Um, I just want to say something as we sang that song, um, and you, you may or may not know, because we use amen, like to end our prayers, right? Amen doesn't mean the end. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what we maybe think of it sometimes. Amen, the word, means may it be, let it be. And I think we all know what it is, right? For there to be things in our lives that are just not quite right. And we're praying and we're seeking God and sometimes the only thing you can really say, and that's why we sing that over and over again, is may it be, Lord, whatever your heart longs to see that is right and good and true and full, if it's relationships that are broken, if it's for your kids, if it's for your marriage, if it's for your neighbors, if it's, if it's mental health, if it's physical health, whatever it is that you're longing for, there's, there's a point at which you just cry out, God, God, may it be. And, and we don't even know how to describe what it is sometimes. But we know that there's some things in this life that are not as they should be. And we cry out and we long for God to do this. This is what the book of Revelation is really all about. Um, we've been journeying through this book in five weeks. I, we can only touch so much. So if you still have questions, we've invited you to, to submit questions. But we also have other opportunities for you to dig deeper into this, learning opportunities, additional resources. Go to foundrychurch.org slash apocalypse, okay? And we've put some info, info there. I'm adding a couple of things. I've interviewed um, Shane Wood, who I'm going to reference, who's a Bible scholar who's done a lot of research, and I had a fantastic conversation with him. And so um, you've, you're going to have an opportunity to hear more and to go deeper, and we'd love to interact with you. Um, but I, I believe that what Scott McKnight says about this book is true. Scott McKnight says the apocalypse, which is the word revelation uh, in the Greek, uh, the apocalypse is not about prediction of the future, but perception and interrogation of the present. Let me say that again. The revelation or the apocalypse is not about prediction of the future, but perception and interrogation of the present. In other words, what we said from the beginning is that John sees something there are truths, there's a divine reality that is revealed to John, the servant, the messenger from Jesus, about Jesus, that then John's going to relay to these seven churches in the first century Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. It's not about so many of the things that we make it be about. We've addressed some of those. There are they're fun, right? And, and I'm not saying you can't like have conversation about the end times. And, but listen, if you do all of that, if you, if you get so fixated on that, you might miss what is a gift to us in this book. The message is so relevant to us. Uh, Greg Beal says that Revelation may be the most relevant book in the entire Bible, Oddly, I always avoided this book and preaching this book because of all those things. And then the more I studied it, the more I realized the church has to hear this because it's so relevant. Revelation may be the most relevant book in the entire Bible speaking to us today with his exhortations for, listen, God's people to remain faithful to the call to follow the Lamb's paradoxical example and not to compromise. You see, Jesus paradoxically achieved victory through seeming defeat. The paradox is the cross, this image that we've like made into something you wear around your neck is a symbol, it's a sign of the brutality and the evil and the darkness of this world and Jesus is seemingly beaten by the cross and yet we know three days later he rose from the dead conquering evil. Listen, the central message of this book is not what we make it so often, and we can't miss that. It's kind of like this guy. I don't know if he was in Houston. It might make sense if he was, right? But you ever been there? I think I see where the... We, 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 we miss. 
We, this is, this is a, 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 an example of missing the point, right? You ever been there? Like in hindsight, you realized like you were so fixated on something and you missed the point. You missed, completely missed the point. So I'm gonna zoom out and I'll look at what is the point of the book of Revelation. And to do this, we're gonna look at the last two chapters. Listen, so much of the conversation is about the middle of this book, And so many times we don't read the first few verses that I addressed the first Sunday, and we don't get to Revelation 21 and 22, which really, it's kind of like watching a movie on an airplane. You ever been there? And if you don't do your math right, you know, you, like you want to avoid at all costs, like starting the movie. You know what I'm talking about? Like, do I have time to finish this movie? Because the worst thing is like 20 minutes of the movie left and the plane lands and you, you want it. I mean, everybody wants to get off the plane, but you don't want to stop that movie. You got to go watch it when you get home, right? Like th- not reading the last two chapters of Revelation, you will miss the point. So what is the point? Revelation records this timeless battle between Babylon and the new Jerusalem. It's a battle between two lords. There's Jesus, the Lamb of God, And there are the empires and the powers of this world that are manifested in their day in Rome. It's a battle between hidden forces, between angels in heaven and this dragon, the beast, the many-headed beast, and the armies. There are armies, and sometimes we don't see the battle, but there is a battle, friends. There's a battle going on all the time. And so in Revelation 21 and 22, what we're given is a perspective on the way the battle ends, on what happens at the end. You see, it's not about predicting when the end will be. We need to get an image of what the end is so that we can live now because Jesus told us we had no business guessing and prognosticating about when he was going to come back and how all that was going to work. That wasn't the point. Get busy doing what I've called you to do, Jesus says to the disciples. Revelation 21 and 22, the seals are broken, there are all these images through the book. The trumpets already finished, the bowls are emptied, Satan and the two beasts and Babylon are thrown into the pit. They are now in exile, they've been defeated forever. All of these forces of evil, all the darkness of the world is cast away and defeated. And God comes and he speaks, just like he spoke in the beginning, to humanity Come, come now. The dwelling place of God is now with humanity. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. If you've ever cried out to God, like, why? God, I I, I need you to show up. You feel far away right now because of the circumstances. Listen, all of those are real human emotions that we know. That's a result of sin and the curse that we're gonna talk about. But, but all of those, what we're given is a glimpse of all of those things are put to bed forever. Forever. You see, the ultimate reality, what John sees is the ultimate reality. The reality we live in now is just temporary and it's not as real as, as what our hearts actually long for. What does he say? 21 verse 4, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Hold on to that image. That's important. The old is put away and the new has come. In Revelation 22, 3, he says, no longer will there be any curse the sea, he says there's no more sea in the, in, the, in, the, in the New Jerusalem. He also says there's no temple because there's no need for a temple because God himself is our temple, is the dwelling place of, you, of God, is with human beings, the people of God, with the, with, in the presence of God, with the power of God and the fullness of God, walking with God, there's perfection, you see, we find ourselves in a garden again. Remember what I said a couple of weeks ago is the, that Revelation constantly links back, links back to the Old Testament, and especially in the first few chapters. 
Revelation 22, 1 and 2. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. You might remember a story about some rivers. Clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. And of the Lamb down the middle of the great city, this great street of the city. On each side of the river stood what? The tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, the healing of all people. You see, this tree, this tree hasn't shown up really in this fashion since Genesis 3. And here it is again. The tree is no longer guarded. The tree is accessible. And so the Bible really ends where it begins. The Bible, this garden paradise where God is united with humanity again, where all that was broken has been restored, that they enjoy the healing and the restoration and the fruitfulness of life, life that they were created, life that we were created to enjoy and to know and to experience life in the presence of our creator, in perfect union with our creator. But as Shane Wood says, the problem is life isn't lived, our life, the life we know, this reality, life isn't lived under Eden's tree or beneath the healing leaves of the tree in Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, but life is lived, listen, between the trees. Life is lived between these two trees that are, they're, that are the beginning and end of Scripture. And beco- listen, between these two trees, life is hard. So many of our so-called gospels today are about how God might wants to make our life easy or better. Okay, and this is a distortion, actually, of the real gospel. God does want us to experience flourishing, yes. But God knows that the world we live in is hard. It's a hard world. It's a hard, life is hard sometimes. And the message to the early church, and thereby the message, I think, to us as well today, is first of all that life can be hard. And we shouldn't be surprised when it is difficult. It's always been since Adam and Eve turned their back on God, since sin entered the world. Because between the two trees, listen, murder is confused with heroism and oppression is labeled peace and restraint is mocked and gentleness is disparaged and love is twisted into self-fulfillment and the poor are maligned and the rich are adored and the prophets are silenced and the profane are revered and the saints are assailed, the adulterous esteemed and kids are a commodity and women are property and race is a justification for slavery. You see, everything that God created in the garden was good and perfect and right and whole and it's what our hearts long for. It's what we know is missing because in the world between the trees, everything that was formed and created and sacred has been desecrated and deformed. And everything that we see, even some of the things that we see that seem good are just a counterfeit for the real thing that our hearts long for because we live in this predicament of being between the trees. This is the first message of Revelation, but thanks be to God, it's not the only message, not the end of the story. Because Revelation 21 and 22 give us a picture that inspires hope and perseverance. You see, life is hard. Life was hard for the early Christians. Life was extremely hard. We underestimate how hard it was. Listen, it was, it was hard. The emperor was feeding Christians to the lions. The emperor was burning them alive. Our persecution, because of their faith, our persecution compared to, our life com- is so easy, really. And yet, I don't want to minimize the difficult things that we all know and go through because they're all rooted in the, this reality of a broken world that sin has desecrated 
the sacred world. But listen, the message of Revelation to that group of people who were facing that intense persecution, I believe is still available to us, and it's the message that life is hard, but there is hope. Life is hard, but there is hope. There's hope for the hurting, the lonely, the depressed, the outcast, the forgotten. There's hope for us when we're in despair. There's hope for us when we have doubts. There's hope for a new, listen, there's hope. Our hope is not in this world. There's hope for a new world. And that doesn't mean that we are just waiting until we go to heaven one day. It means that heaven is invading us now. It means that the cross, remember, if we're in Christ, then that means, yes, the life will sometimes be hard because the cross is hard. And if we're following Jesus, there will be crosses to bear sometimes. But what appears to the world to be defeat will actually be victory because God has conquered death and hell and the evil of this world. And so even if you experience the cross, the book of Revelation is telling you it's not the end of the story. There is a resurrection. And so bear the cross with courage. Bear the cross with hope. Bear the cross and do not listen to the lies. You see, this is one of the subplots of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, and John knows, and the early church that was facing persecution knew that there were all of these things that they, they heard that were not the truth, and John wants them to see, and Jesus wants them to see, that they're not true. Do not give in. Do not be tempted to compromise to give in, to retreat, to run away. When life is difficult, turn to God even more fiercely. The things that we tell ourselves, maybe our biggest battle today is in our minds. The things we tell ourselves, you're just that way, you will never change, just do what feels right, just follow your heart. No, don't follow your heart, follow Jesus and his heart for you. Find out what he has designed you to be and live fully into that. This is not, listen, everything in this life is not just the way that God wants it to be. There is a battle. And God calls us to wage war, but not in the ways of this world. The way, his way, is the cross. To lay down our lives. To submit ourselves wholly to him. You see, the, 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 the lies are all rooted in the old, and Jesus is calling us into the new creation, the new life. Between the two trees, Christ dislodges the fruit in Genesis 3, from Genesis 3. You see, the good news is there's a tree in the beginning in Genesis, there's a tree in the end, the new Jerusalem, right? We're in the middle. But thanks be to God, there's another tree right in the middle in the climax of the story. It's an old, rugged, ugly, bloody tree that reminds us of Jesus' love and the extent of his love, reminds us of his, his power over the grave. You see, the cross in the middle is that tree of death. But Jesus took the death for the sin of the world so that we might have life. Jesus became death for us because Adam and Eve chose death and each one of us chooses death. When we turn our backs on God, we become one. You see, sin is more. Sin is more than what we've made it. How many of you grew up with this idea of sin being about doing the wrong things, right? Where I grew up, it was always don't cuss or chew or smoke or run with girls who do. That's kind of, kind of the old adage. You might have heard that, right? Like stay clean, stay away from the things of this world and do the right things. Be good, essentially. And even if, even if it was the gospel of Christ, it was, it was be good. Only, the only way we can be good is through Jesus, Right? But listen, sin is just so much more than being bad, than behaving bad, than making choices that, that listen, sin is far worse than what we've made it. That's the bad news. The Genesis 1, God 
said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals and over the creatures that move along the ground. So God created, notice what he said, God said, let us. There's the mystery of the Trinity here, right? Jesus is present and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, there, God is by his very nature relationship, relational, connection, unity. And so we can't separate the members of the Trinity. They are one in perfect union. And yet they are distinct expressions of his presence in different ways. And in this story, it's the presence of God that creates human beings in his likeness to be one with him in the same mysterious kind of way. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them distinct, different, and yet made to be in union with one another. Out of this holy and loving union, God creates humanity. He makes them to be one with each other. We were created for union, friends. That's why it says that a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife and they become one flesh. We have the same capacity. It's a sign. It's a symbol of what we are to be with God, how we are made to be one with God. You see, sin is ultimately not just misbehaving. Sin is breaking union with God, a union that we were created to have. And when all creation has been separated and severed from its creator, what we have is chaos. What we have is the world that we know, the world of brokenness. This becoming one flesh is forging a bond that is impossible to break. We see the imagery all through Revelation of, of marriage and also of food, interestingly, um, because what you, you are what you eat, right? At some point, what you eat becomes part of you, like there's this transformation, and I don't want to press into that analogy too much or it might get gross, but, but like just there is imagery of eating and consuming the word or the truth of God in a way. In, in Revelation 10, John says, I saw an angel and he asked me, he, he asked me to give him the little scroll and, and he said to me, take it and eat it and I will turn your stomach, it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. And I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Okay, so this scroll is the message or the word or the revelation from God. And he says, he tells him to eat it, right? So people ask, do you read the Bible literally or figuratively? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> right, I, I try to use my head, my brain, like because some of this, these are images of a truth that is deeper, right? He's not... Literally, I wouldn't have an eye or an arm if I did literally everything that the Bible says, right? Um, he says, eat it. And then I was told you must prophesy again about my peoples, nations, languages, and kings. In other words, the message is becoming one with the messenger, and when we become one with Christ, we become whole again, yes, but we become part of the message, the word that he has of hope for this world. You see, sin ultimately separates us from the relationship that we were designed to have with God. In the garden, in the first garden, Adam and Eve were told, don't eat of the tree and that was the one boundary, that was the one condition for their relationship with God to flourish, and yet the snake, the serpent, the voice, the tempter whispers this deception in their ear. He's been doing it ever since, telling us we can be like God, telling us we really don't it's not about, listen, it wasn't about picking the fruit and eating it, it's about the condition of the heart. It's about disunion, separating what was designed to be one. 
And they were separated from the garden. Read it again and see how many times it talks about separation and exile all through the Old Testament and what the people experienced. But listen, the good news is that Jesus came to to undo the separation, to reunite us and to make us a new creation. God did not send his son to the earth to create a new religion. He sent his son to create a new creation. He sent his son to undo all that the curse had broken, to make us one with Christ again. And so the good news, friends, is that we can experience that kind of wholeness now to a certain extent, and yet we still live in the world that is not fully remade. So you and I were not made to live in a broken state. We were made to be reunited with Christ and to walk with him and through the power of the Spirit to be given life the same way that his life led him to his death, but to overcome death. And so the book of Revelation really does this. It it, it unveils this reality that life, life can be hard, but there is hope. And there is hope because there was one who was willing to hang on a tree that we might experience the blessing of the tree again. That we might be reunited with the one who created us and gave us life. And that he might recreate us into a beautiful witness for him. Even in the face of difficulty in life. Even when we face down death, that we can do it knowing that he has conquered. And so it's about life being difficult, but hope that overcomes and about an ultimate victory. Revelation 22, Jesus says, look, I am coming soon. Now, ever since he said that, people have been speculating and wondering what Jesus must have meant by soon, because it sure doesn't seem like he's in a hurry, does it? Amen? But I think Jesus knew that throughout all of history, we would always wonder when he was coming back because of the brokenness of this world. And he wanted them to to persevere and to take heart and to know that in the grand scheme of things, eternity in our time And God's perspective on eternity, we're like a mist. Time is nothing. You see, the the point is not when he's coming back, but the fact fact that he will come back one day to restore all things. That these words of hope are not just words that we read at a funeral, But they're words that we should read every day to remind us of the truth because we're surrounded by half-truths. That the brokenness of this world has nothing on Christ. That he will come back and he will be victorious and his cross actually was the victory. And so what do we do? We come to him. That's what he says. That's the invitation at the end of the book. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears come. And let the one who is thirsty come and drink from this river of life. Do you know what it is? Another imagery, right, that's used all through the Old Testament. Have you ever experienced real thirst? And your body thirsts and all you can think about is quenching that thirst Will our souls thirst in the same way? But Jesus is the one who comes to quench the thirst. And he says, come to you, come to me, those who are heavy laden, who are burdened, who carry these doubts and who wonder where God is. Come to me and drink and know that when I return, I will make all things right again. And you can live as a new creation now, here and now. The invitation, friends, is this morning to come to Jesus. And so I want to invite you to bow your heads with me. And I want to invite you in whatever way the Spirit is leading you. Maybe, maybe life has been difficult and you know all too well the burden of the cross and, and, and you're crying out to God and you need hope and even all of this sometimes sounds so, so much, it sounds too good to be true. 
And I want to just invite us to, to receive the words that we've been given. Receive this message and do not let the secondary things that we like to fixate on distract us from the real message of revelation. And that is that Christ's victory brings hope. That life can be difficult sometimes, even when we follow Christ, and sometimes because we follow Christ. In this world between the trees, life will not always be perfect, but this world is not the ultimate reality. And the one who came 2,000 years ago to live among us, to teach, to perform miracles that were a sign of his power over all creation, will come again. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who was there in creation and at the cross. And one day he will return in final victory. And we will be with him. And all that our hearts long for will be met in him and him alone. And so the invitation from the Spirit today is to come to him to bow at his feet, to put our trophies aside, the things that give us value, the things that we've used to define ourselves, the things that we've run after, hoping they would fill us in a way that they always have come up short. We'd lose all of those things and we'd find Christ and we'd set them aside and we'd each day wake up and say, Lord, make me new again. Help me live into the newness, whatever this, this day brings, good or bad. Help me be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, knowing that Christ can rescue. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down. Because we have sold out for what is real and what is true and what is lasting. And that is not this world but that is the new creation that will one day be ushered in by Jesus when he returns. And so it's with anticipation, not with an attitude of retreat, but a radical hope that believes, even when we don't see, that knows real victory is beyond the circumstances of our life we come to Jesus because he is the only one to turn to. He's the only one who has life. He's the only one who brings real hope. And so, Lord, we, we confess to you that we have, yes, we have sinned, but we have been in union with the darkness of this world, the lies we've tasted. And yet you come to cleanse us to make us new and to reunite us with you. And what a beautiful, beautiful grace it is. And all you ask us to do is receive it, to receive you and what you've done. And so Lord, give us, even if we don't have words, help us turn our hearts to you. Help us turn our lives to you. We repent, God, we turn to you. We ask you to save us, to rescue us from what we would be without you, and to make us new. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.